Good day to all our viewers. This joint Rap Pamet webinar session is the second of the BRAP Pamet webinar series, brought to you by the BioRisk Association of the Philippines Incorporated and the Philippine Association of Medical Technologies Incorporated, with both associations' goal of enhancing the capabilities of the laboratorians, especially those working in laboratories handling the SARS CoV 19 virus the causative agent of the COVID-19 disease. This is the clip of the first speaker, Mr. Edson Simon. The video clip of the second speaker, Mr. Louis Cadeo lecture is presented in another video. Kindly hit the like icon and subscribe button to get access to more training videos. Hit the notification bell too, if you would like to be notified by email of future lectures. Enjoy viewing the video as much as we enjoyed planning and preparing this for you. The Biorisk Association of the Philippines, in collaboration with the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists, warmly welcomes you all to its second joint webinar. The Biosafety Cabinet or BSC is one of the most important component of engineering control in your laboratory second only to the infrastructure. Similar to selecting your first car, you need to know what it can do, where would you park it, and most importantly how to drive and maintain it. Let's dive into the process of BSC selection, installation, and proper use and maintenance with two expert speakers. They will share with you their knowledge and experiences so you can drive your BSC and get home safely. It is my pleasure to introduce our session moderator for today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, Ms. Michaela Sayo, BRAP Assistant Treasurer. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. I'm Micaela Sayo, Assistant Treasurer of BRAP and the past president of PAMET Bulacan. And I will be the moderator for tonight, the second BRAP PAMET webinar series made possible by PAMET's e-learning and BRAP distance learning machineries. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is the head of the Laboratory Operational Unit of the Research Institute for Tropical Medicines Laboratory Research Division. He is a medical technologist by profession and received his degree from the University of Santo Tomas and had his Master in Public Health from the Institute of Community and Family Health Incorporated. He started his career in RITM as a project staff during or working on rotavirus. Majority of his career was spent working under the microbiology department and the special pathogens laboratory where he dealt with high consequence pathogens extrapulmonary TB, suspected cases of bacillus anthracis, highly pathogenic avian influenza, and Henipovirus, virus, to name a few. He also learned or earned a professional certification in bio-risk management status granted by the International Federation of Biosafety Association in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Our resource speaker will share his knowledge using his experience spanning from the technical and management aspect of laboratory operations by discussing the proper selection and installation requirements for one of our most used and valued engineering controls in the laboratory, our biosafety cabinet. My dear colleagues and friends, Join me in welcoming our first speaker tonight, Mr. Edson Michael Mangubat Simon. Yes, hi, good evening. So, my topic is the proper selection and installation of the biosafety cabinet. All right, again, the disclaimer since I'm in the government service, I cannot endorse anything. And the presentation and the contents of the presentation are of my own thoughts and not of RITM, DOH. Or the Philippine government. Again, our objectives to discuss what the BSC is and how it works, to identify the different types of biosafety cabinets, 
and to understand the different factors to consider when selecting the right BLC for your hospital, institution, or laboratory. Again, our three questions. First, we need to know what a hood is before we be able to, sec to select the proper hood for you and to know where to place and how to use it. So first again, what is biosafety? This is a very long presentation for biosafety and very scientific. Basically, what it means is we want to keep the bugs in, the bed, the bad bugs in. We don't want them escaping to the environment, infecting people, destroying the environment, polluting the environment. Or basically, it just means containment. Gusto lang natin makontain lahat organism sa isang lugar para hindi siya maka-infect ng ibang tao. These are the four levels of your biosafety. Biosafety level one, two, three, and four. The most common for all laboratories, diagnostic laboratories, is biosafety level two. This is where you process your streptococcus pneumoniae, your E. coli. So this is the most common biosafety level. And this is where you require your biosafety cabinet. Again, what is a biosafety cabinet? We've been talking about biosafety cabinet. Sir Louis has discussed the ins out of, of handling, use, and maintenance. And uh, by the way, I would like to highlight again the, the spill basin that Mr. Louis said that is the most neglected part of your biosafety cabinet. Okay, what is a hood? WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual, third edition. This is a very old edition. I think this one was published in 2004. I think they're coming up with the fourth edition. So this is a very scientific and very long explanation. But I like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention definition. A biological safety cabinet is the primary means of containment. Primary means of containment to develop for working safely with infectious microorganisms. So this is an illustration. If I told you this is a biosafety cabinet, would you believe me? If I told you this is, was, this is a chemical fume hood, would you believe me? If I told you this is a laminar flow hood, would you believe me? Or the most common one, uh, if I told you that this is a PCR hood, would you believe me? So if you go to your laboratories, you look at this type of equipment, you might mistake one for the other. But we need to know what are the differences. So the biosafety cabinet is used for infectious biological agents. This is not meant for your uh, reagent preparations. You have a different cabinet for that one. So the biosafety cabinet protects the user, the environment, and the material handling. It protects the user because it keeps the organisms inside, same with the environment. And how does it protect the material? It provides clean air within the chamber of the cabinet, the work area of the cabinet. Now I have to make an addition to this uh, third column. HEPA filter or ULPA filtration is required. So we have a new technology, ULPA, ULTA, ULPA filtration that I will discuss later on. And all exhausted air from the building should be filtered out if you're using the biosafety cabinet. Now, the chemical fume hood, on the other hand, is just used for dangerous chemicals. It's meant to, kept, to keep the fumes away from the user. It protects the user. There's no requirement for HEPA filtration. Although there are chemical fume hoods that have neutralizers, they have carbon filters, just to mitigate a certain percentage of our chemicals. And exhausted air is not treated. Again, there are systems, add-on systems to your chemical fume hood that could help mitigate the vapors of your chemicals. Okay. Laminar flow hood. This is used for handling sterile material. This is intended uh, for the material to be protected just for the protection of the material. It actually makes your biosafety cabinet positively pressured, forcing dirty air out. So it feeds the internal chamber of your laminar flow hood with HEPA filtered air. So there are no particles, there are no contaminants, and it pushes it out of the, of the biosafety cabinet towards the end user. So if you could imagine you're using a laminar flow hood and you're processing TB cultures, that would be disastrous. PCR cabinets. Now PCR cabinets, there are two types. 
One is the dead air chamber and one is the filtered air. The filtered air works similarly to your laminar flow hood. And the dead air is just simply a sterile cabinet with static air inside. So you just maintain the cleanliness of the internal chamber with your decontamination processes and your proper, dot, uh, proper uh, work uh, procedures. And there are no need for uh, filtration for this one. Right, next. Now, how does a BSC work? Do you know how your BSC works? Okay. Uh, basically, air blowers either create a vacuum to suck in air or pushes air through filters. Again, the filters may be HEPA filter or OPA filter. The traps particles carrying pathogens of a certain size, letting clean air pass through, which uh, creates your quote unquote air curtain that prevents the pathogens from escaping your cabinet and clean air within the cabinet to prevent cross contaminations. Okay, now the particles are being trapped either through impact, interception, or diffusion. We'll go into this. But first, we need to know what our HEPA filter is, or our filters are. So the filters are either HEPA rated or OPA rated. Now, if you say HEPA, it means high efficiency particulate air filter. So if you say HEPA, you must include the filter in the end. You can filter out particles 0 0.3 microns with an efficiency rating of 99.97%. Now, ULPA filters or your ultra low particulate air filters can filter out particles 0 0.1 microns in diameter with an efficiency rating of 99.9995%. So, I guess everyone will be shifting to ULPA filters now. But before you do that, you need to again go back to your work processes, deter determine what you actually need because definitely ULPA filters would cost more than your HEPA filters. Now, this is just a simple animation of how it works. So if you're clean air, you pass through both filters, HEPA and ULPA. Now, if you're uh, a particle that is lesser than 0 0.3 microns, but greater than 0 0.12 microns, you get stuck in your HEPA filters. Now, if you're bigger than that one, you get stuck by your HEPA filters, right? So this is a simple illustration of how, how how our HEPA filters work. I, I'll try to see if I can bump this up. Yeah, there you go. So one is your impact. So basically your particles fly into the filters, directly impacting it, and they attach to the filters. These are glass fiber filters. One is interception, they weave, then they slightly adhere to the bottom. Uh, this one is your high speed, medium speed uh, attachments. Now this one, this is very interesting, diffusion. This is where your particles are very slow moving. They don't actually hit anything until they hit or they get attracted to your filters and get attracted to the, attached to the filters itself. Right. Now this is what your uh, HEPA filter or OPA filter looks like. So it is um, folded. Uh, filter paper or your filter material, then you have your corrugated filter materials in between. So this is interception, this is impact, and this is diffusion. Now you may ask yourselves, uh, what is the size of your COVID-19 virus or your, sorry, your SARS-CoV-2 virus? It's actually smaller than 0 0.1 microns. But the particles carrying those viruses to be infective are much larger than 0 0.3 microns. Okay. Now we have two standards being used. Uh, most common standards. We have standards for the US, you have standards for Europe, you have standards for Japan, China, and Australia, in fact. So you have several standards, but here in the Philippines, uh, these are the most uh, the two most common standards that we use. The ANSI NSF 49 actually from the US and EN 12469 from Europe. So these are just a basic uh, comparison between the two standards. Okay, for Europe, you could use a third party independent certifying organizations if you're doing the certification in Europe. In ANSI, NSF, 
you need to be certified by the National Science Foundation by themselves. This is a government uh, government organization. Now for EN uh, 12469, there's only one class of biosafety cabinet, which is equivalent to your class 2A2 under the ANSI or NSF 47 uh, standards. Okay. So uh, if you're buying your biosafety cabinets, if you just say class 2, you might get an, a biosafety cabinet that is rated for EN uh, 12469. But if you specify class 2A2, you most probably will get the NSF 40, 49 certified biosafety cabinet. So the most common here in the Philippines is your NSF 49. So we will just focus on the class uh, defined under that uh, standard. So you have your class one. So class one provides personal and environmental protection without product protection. So this is your airflow. All the air comes in. If for example, your product is in right here, Imagine if your environment is dirty, all the dirty air passes through your product before it is filtered out and blown by your blower outside. So for class one, you only have one HEPA filter. It's between the product and the exhaust blower. So this is one of the principles in using your biosafety cabinet. Your blower here creates a vacuum in this space, which sucks in air from this portion. Now class two. So class two cabinets are partial barrier systems that rely on movement of air to provide personal environmental and product protection. I need to emphasize that one and product protection. Okay. Class two cabinets are designed for work involved being microorganism assigned to buy safety one up to four. Again, uh, this should not be used as a standalone uh, biosafety measure. It should be used in tandem with different engineering admin uh, work practices and PPE. So you can use your class two for biosafety level four. However, it must be located within a biosafety level four facility. Don't go to your boss and say, boss, meron tayong class two A2. We could work with culturing COVID-19. Do not do that. Right? Now, there are, there are several types of your class two. So you have your class two A1, class two A2, Class 2B1, B2, and a newer addition, the Class 2C1. Okay, for basically your Class 2A1, you have your blower underneath the basin. So not directly underneath, there are dividers there to prevent your spillage from getting to the blower itself. But basically, this is how it looks. So your room air goes in. Uh, the blower creates such a vacuum that your room air comes in the front grill. That's why it's very important not to block that front grill. If you block this front grill, imagine where your dirty air will go to your product, cross contamination. So work practices, important. So do not block your front grill. Air comes in there, gets pushed by the blower up to the, chair, to the plenum. Some of the air passes out here. Some of the air goes down. So you have your 70-30 ratio of recycled air. So 70% gets recycled here. 30% gets, uh, gets, gets pushed out of the cabinet. So the 70% that gets recycled passes through a HEPA filter, which, is, which filter, filters the air, producing clean air. That protects your product from contamination. So part of that goes to your front grill again. And part of that goes to your rear grill again. So again, work practices, no blockage of both grills, front and back. So that's what that's your class 2 A1. Your class 2 A2. Now this is very interesting. This is the most commonly used by safety, biological safety cabinet in all laboratories in the Philippines. All right? So go back to your laboratory tomorrow morning, check your BSEs. Check if they are EN12469 or they are NSF49 uh, certified. So if you're class 2A2, again, clean air goes in. Now your blower is up here. It creates now a vacuum in this space. So there is a vacuum. 
there is no positive pressure, dirty air. Okay, so there's a vacuum here. It sucks in again both grills, front and rear, up to a plenum, goes to your biosafety blower. It gets pushed here. Portion of that goes out. Portion of that goes back in to your work area. So similar principle with your A1. Clean air produces a clean environment here. Ensures that if you manipulate aerosols in this portion, no particles go here, go here, or more importantly, go here. Okay. So your clean air is distributed across your the surface of your filter, producing a uniform downstream. Importantly, there's a downstream in this part. This is where you get your air, air curtain. So that air curtain prevents dirty air from going out. So if you do your smoke test, um, you will see your air should go in and down the front grill, not in and across the table, right? So in and down the front grill. It shouldn't go in and out. Now that's a, if you, if ever your biosafety cabinet does that, inform your supervisor immediately and do not use the biosafety cabinet, okay? So that's your type, class two type A2, right? Now class two type A2, again, there are systems wherein you have to duck it out. So uh, what are the conditions for ducting out your biosafety cabinet? One, if you're using, if you're, if you want to exhaust room, uh, exhaust laboratory air. And two, if you're working with um, volatile chemicals that are very noxious or toxic or toxic. So you, you would want um, those uh, fumes to be ejected immediately outside of your building. So for your A2, you cannot hard duct your A2. It should be a plenum type or a canopy type. So in this illustration, you can see this is not attached to your A2 cabinet. There is a space here, just enough for your exhaust system to suck in room air and exhaust it out, not so much show as to put additional pressure to your by safety cabinet. So this has to be balanced. Your exhaust duct should be balanced with the exhaust system of your by safety cabinet and the supply of your room. You cannot, uh, it is good to have a negative pressure in your room. However, if you have too much negative pressure in your room, you, you will get, you will generate several problems. So one, too much negative pressure may cause your ceiling to fall down. Imagine if you're sucking on your um, Zesto juice and you suck out all the air. What happens to your Zesto juice? It crumbles inside, it includes. That's a similar way. So that's the importance of balancing out your exhaust air here with your supply air in the room. Okay. Now class 2B1. Now your generally all your B class 2B. B series are all hard ducted. So this is an illustration of that hard ducting. So you have a hard duct here and you have a blower there. So similarly to your A2, you have your air coming in. You have two slots here. However, the front grill air is get will be get sucked by your lower blower and pushed up to this plenum. This is a positive pressure area. Then this one is connected actually to this portion. So this supplies your clean air for your chamber, okay? Now the rear duct, this is where you, you work most probably, and most of the infe uh, infection materials, if aerosolized will be get blown here, will be blown here, will be sucked up to this plenum, which is negatively, uh, negatively pressured, and gets sucked through a biosafety, uh, to your filters outside, and blown by your blower outside. Now, this one is attached to one of your ducting, hard ducting, uh, going outside of the building. So that's your B1. Now, this is your B2. If you can see the differences of your B2, your A1, your B1 actually recycles 30% air, sorry, 30% air, and 70% is exhausted. That is for B1. So the next one for the B2, all air is exhausted. Nothing is used up. And nothing is recycled. So this is very unidirectional. Your blower here sucks in 
from air from the top, pushes it down to the filters, generating a clean air space here. If contaminated, they go inside two, uh, two vents, your front grill and your real grill, get sucked in. This is a very good uh, negative pressure plenum because it is being sucked in and out by a blower on the top. So in the Philippines, I think I've seen most commonly is the A2 and the B2. B2, not so much so. A2 is the most common one. Right? Because B2 is very expensive to maintain and you have your ex external ductings to maintain as well. Now C1, this is very new. Um, NSF 47 say, states that it could be converted for use into an A2 or either B2. So it's a very, very new uh, technology for biosafety cabinets, right? So in comparison with your A2, this has two blowers. Your A2 has only one. Now again, this one exhausts 100% of our captured air. Okay, So captured air is the dirty, dirty air. No, instead of your B2 sucking in clean air from the top, it sucks in air from the front grill, one of the front grills, then up to your plenum and down here. So it creates a negative space in this area. And again, this one blow, this blower creates an, another negative space here. So negative spaces, negative pressure spaces are very good to ensure that they are containment. You do not want positive pressure areas in your biosafety cabinet because if you have positively pressured, um, imagine blowing into your Zesto uh, juice again. If there are holes, where does the content go? Outside. So we don't want any positive pressure within this area or surrounding this area. We would want everything as negatively pressured as possible. So here, because it's being sucked, it's negative pressure. Here, it's being sucked, it's negative pressure as well. Okay. Now, this is the interesting part. You can hard duct it or you can... Um, thimble ducted or canopy ducted. So that's why they say it's it's very versatile. You could use it for either one. Right. Now class three, class three. This is a very expensive and very hard to maintain system. The entire system is sealed. There's a leak test to ensure that nothing escapes the chamber within this parameter. Right. So this 100% exhausted system, uh, air is filtered in through a pre-filter, then again filtered here. This blower at the bottom generates enough force to create a very big vacuum to ensure that air supply is constant in this chamber. So they have a similar system, two front, two grills, one in the front, one in the back. Now this one, all, this, all the air is sucked in the bottom, pushed up, and sucked again by another blower. So you have your negative pressure in this area. You have a negative pressure in this area caused by this one. And this front grill or sash is sealed. You cannot open that. You have your gloves there. And this one is hard ducted outside. So you have several layers of protection one, two, three, four filters before everything gets exhausted. This is an example of your uh, class three biosafety cabinet. There's a very old version when, wherein there's a very big uh, class three and you have to go under the class three uh, biosafety cabinet and actually insert yourself here wearing, um, let's say a half coverall or sorry, half positive pressure suit. So that's how, how how it works before. Okay, so how it works is you have your pass box here. You place your material, close this one, insert your hands in the gloves, open this door, get your material out. Other systems have an attached by uh, autoclave at the end and others have an incubator on the other end instead of an autoclave. 
So if you're processing your sample here, for example, a pure culture of your biter ESM anthrax, you place it here, you manipulate it, you throw it inside your autoclave, at, which is attached to this portion, and that's it. So no contaminated material can ever escape this system. But do not use this for your routine because this is a very, very, very expensive system to maintain. Okay, so we'll be talking about ducting and everything. This is an example of your ducting outside. So all ductings have what you call dampers. Those dampers control the air velocity or how much air actually passes through uh, through your pipes or your stock or your ducting. Okay. So if you're gonna place the ducting, you need to have a clearance of 10 feet or three meters above the highest adjacent building. So if you have two structures standing by uh, beside each other and you're happening to be the lower one, you need to place your ducting 10 meters above, I'm sorry, 10 feet above the next one. Because if it's lower than, than the adjacent building, imagine where all, all your exhaust air goes to, all right? So in biosafety, uh, we have several layers of, or we have several methods of addressing uh, organism spills. One is to basically first eliminate the organism itself para mawala na siya, wala ka nang lilinisin, di ba? Now the second one is to dilute it. If you cannot eliminate it, you, you contain it, then you dilute it. Right. So the, the ducting here is just another a level of ensuring that if ever something escapes, it gets blown out and it gets diluted before and before actually getting to infect other people right so this should be upright there should be no covers there should be no label um sorry uh elbows here okay now we know what our hood is how it functions how our HEPA filters work you know you know the different types Basically, I think you know what you you would want to use in your, your facility. Now, how do you select it? So again, everything has to go through risk assessment. You need to know what your processes are. You need to know what you plan to handle and how many items of that do you want to handle or the volume. Right? So it has to go through several processes and you have to include everyone in your system your boss, you as a technical, and of course the management, okay? Because the management will be the ones to give you the money to, to buy your equipment. Now this is just a small glimpse of operational assessment. You look at the five S's, the system, the sample, the structure, the standards, and the support. Okay? So this is just a basic comparison between risk assessment and five S of, of operational assessment. So for system, it's an end-to-end -end process review, which includes the, your HR competencies. As opposed to your risk assessment, it's the same thing. Process review, available administrative controls, work practices, and personal accountability. Again, for your sample, or sample, uh, the operational assessment can be tailored fit to any type of situation. Could be your laboratory, could be your engineering, it could be your HR concerns, but it's, the, the principle of the five S's is the same. A sample could be paper, document, or specimen, or organism, right? There's now the structure. Available engineering controls, similarly with operational assessment, what facility do you have in place? So before selecting your BSE, oh, I want this one and I want that one. Um, look at your facility first if it could support actually your biosafety cabinet. For example, based on your risk assessment, you would need a class 2 B2 uh, by safety cabinet. However, if you look at your structure, hindi pala magkasya sa pintuan, hindi pala magkasya sa kwarto, at ang pinakamahalaga, wala ka palang lugar pag lalagyan ng ducting or you don't have any space to place your ducting. Okay. Now, standards. So, for by safety, you have your by safety guidelines, um, interim guidelines, guidelines, WHO standards. All right. For operational assessment, you need to look at your relevant regulations and laws. Uh, you might want to buy certain equipment, but it may be illegal in your area. 
fortunately in the Philippines or unfortunately for the Philippines, we don't have enough regulations to control what type of biosafety you may you may buy or you may use, right? But again, look at again your relevant regulations. Uh, there may be ordinances in your area where you cannot use this type of biosafety cabinet because it blows air to one area which is illegal, right? So you have to look at the regulations itself or the civil laws. Uh, well, yeah, one of the particular one uh, law is the one that we have now for, for the COVID laboratories, or it is not a law actually, it's just an administrative order. I think it's the administrative order number 14 for DOH, which um, places the, the requirements for your COVID laboratory. I think it requires class two, A2 uh, biosafety cabinet. So you can buy your class one cabinet for, uh, for example, sample and activation. You cannot use that one for that purpose. Okay. Support. Now, this is very important. I heard uh, Mr. Lewis' uh, uh, question and portion. There was a question regarding certification. Now, that's one of the things that you have to consider. You might want, you might be tempted to buy the most cheapest biosafety cabinet. However, look at the after sales support of your biosafety cabinet. Is there someone to able to certify or calibrate your biosafety cabinet? Are the consumables or are the filters readily available? You have to look at those things. Um, Philippines is a very big archipelago. We have several laboratories in different corners of the of the Philippines, and not all places can be reached easily by your distributors. So you might want to buy the more expensive one, just because they have the after sales service or support available in their area. So this is one of the things that is being missed. Uh, uh, sorry overlooked by laboratorians, the after sales service. It's very important, right? Now, uh, NSF 47 uh, series of 2018, which is very, this is the recent, uh, recent issue ones. They have guide questions actually in place in that standard. So I think you can look this up in the internet and download a piece of it or a PDF it, the PDF copy of it. And they have these five questions that could actually that are very helpful actually in selecting your biosafety cabinet. The first question is what needs to be protected, which is very logical. You buy your biosafety cabinet to protect things. What are what are all of the different types of work to be done in the biosafety cabinet? Again, the process. The third question: what types and quantities of chemical vapors will be generated in the biosafety cabinet? Now, this is a very good question. So we, we not just only focus on the biological part, but also the materials that we are handling. So if you plan to do, for example, um, sample inactivation and you're using a toxic chemical, you might want to look into a system that has ducting to exhaust room air and biosafety cabinet air, right? Now, the fourth question, if the biosafety requires an exhaust system, is there an appropriate location for the cabinet in its ductwork? Again, um, in the Philippines, the building always comes first before the planning, and that's uh, uh, that's one of our, our, our gaps in the laboratory. We want to put up the laboratory as fast as we want. However, we, we forget to, to look into the, the finer details, and this is one of the most overlooked parts. If you plan to place your exhaust, make sure to, to place your laboratory at the far end of the building, away from adjacent buildings and away from residences, right? So the last question, if the exhaust system malfunctions, does the user understand its impact on the BSC's ability to maintain personal and environment protection and containment? Now, this is, this, I think this one is more applicable to your biosafety class 2 B2s, right? Okay, for now, what needs to be protected? Again, know your material, uh, know the personal environment, all three, actually. So do you just want to protect your material or do you want to protect the personal environment? So again, firstly, when I, when I show you the differences between the laminar flow hoods, the chemical flow hoods, um, you need to know what you're handling and what you want to be protected from. Okay, if you want to protect all three, then go for your biosafety cabinets. What are all of the different types of work to be done in class two, BSE? Again, previously, um, 
there are risk groups which was used to determine what type of cabinet you need to use. But now in the majority of by safety and risk assessment and risk management, we not look only at the organism that is present, but also the process that you are doing. You might be uh, processing anthrax, but those are anthrax RNA extracts. Do you need your biosafety cabinet for that one? You might, you might, but not at the same level as when you are handling your, bi your bacillus anthracis in pure culture form. Okay, so that's the definition of, you know the different types of work to be done in your class two BSC. Okay, definitely there should be no viral cultures for SARS-CoV-2 virus, except in biosafety level four facilities, not cabinet, level four facility, okay? What types and quantities of chemical vapors will be generated? Again, I, I went through this earlier. Now this part is very interesting, the flammable part. Do you use chemicals in your biosafety cabinet? Are they flammable? Now I'm gonna say a, a word that is very common, not commonly used in the, in the facility. Are your biosafety cabinets intrinsically safe to be used with flammables? So intrinsically safe means if there's a flammable chemical being used, Will your biosafety cabinet not produce any sparks to ignite that vapor? Now that's one of the things that you need to look, to look at. If you're looking at very minimum amount of your vapors and it could be easily diluted by the air, it not, you do not need to worry. But you're, if you're working, for example, with uh, liters of your absolute alcohol inside your biosafety cabinet, now you, you need to be worried. Um, di ba minsan nag-ground nga kayo? So static. So that's one of the things that you need to look at. The the static energy. Um, are your sockets safe? Won't they produce sparks? Okay. And of course, the corrosive chemicals. Now, um, I think there are people who are using concentrated hypo, uh, hydrogen, uh, sorry, concentrated hydrogen chloride. Now, that's very, very tough uh, chemical. If you use it in your in your biosafety cabinet, which is not rated for your strong chemicals, it may damage the body and destroy the airflow, create leaks. We don't want that in your biosafety cabinet. In your biosafety cabinet, the most common one, I think the class 2A2 may range from 400,000 to as high as 800,000 pesos. Again, the ductwork. So you need to know where you want to place your biosafety cabinet. Is it in a building installation, in the middle of the building? Is it in the rooftop, which will make it easier? Or is it underground? Okay. Now, if the exhaust system all functions, does the user understand? Now, um, yeah, these are very tough um, one to explain. The biosafety cabinet is connected to an exhaust duct that has been verified to meet or exceed seal class A. Again, this is used basically for your... Um, class 2B2 cabinets and probably your class 3 cabinets as well. Now, where and how do you locate your hood? Now, this is a very, very, very common challenge among laboratorians. Uh, I think this is a very good portion of this lecture. So, baka bukas, magdala kayo ng mga metro sa mga opisina nyo, magsusukat-sukat na tayo dito. Right? Again, clearances. Now, these are the clearances for your biosafety cabinet. Six inches from the back, six inches from the side, um, 20 inches between biosafety cabinets and bench tops along perpendicular wall. So we go through this first. So you have a column here. You need to have six inches distance from this one. Six inches this one from, from the, sorry, this is a bigger one. 20 inches or 500 millimeter between by safety cabinet on the side. Okay. So this would make room for people walking along this area. Now the six inches in this side and at the back is just the space for you to be able to manipulate or for your engineers to be able to manipulate the equipment if ever they need to service it. Okay. So six inches back from the back. 
Now you have your work area in the front. So this is where you actually put yourself in. This is an imaginary area in the front of your biosafety cabinet. There should be, sorry. Yeah, 40 inches. This should be 40 inches or approximately one meter. All right? That's for you. Now, if you have a door here, you need to get a 40 inches here. If there are people walking here, you have a bench top here, you have a door here, it should be 60 inches or 1.5 meters. Okay? Nakasclean up na mga tao? Alright. Now, ceiling clearance. This is another one, most common problem. There should be at least 12 inches of clearance between the top of your filter or the access port of your filter, if there's a structure here, and any obstruction on top. Again, not the ceiling, but any obstruction. Your ceiling may be here, but your water lines may be crossing here. And please avoid placing your biosafety cabinet under water lines. We don't want any electrical equipment under any water line, any plumbing lines. If those leak, goodbye. All right? Now, exhaust requirements. If your, again, biosafety cabinet requires ducting, you might, you should consider that one. Okay? Now, your class 2A2 doesn't have a blower strong enough to blow your dirty air up your ducting and into your exhaust exhaust ducting there are always mechanical exhaust systems for your external ducting All right now if you're going to ask me the airflow the standard airflow for your exhaust well it depends on what you want to have in your environment which again goes back to your risk assessment okay Now, this is what I'm telling you about. Avoid cabinet locations that require either an elbow directly on top of the cabinet's exhaust because this prevents your engineers, again, to get on top of your biosafety cabinet and do the air measurements. Okay. Now, electrical requirements. Now, in the Philippines, we have your 220 volts and the standard frequency of 60 hertz. So you have to look into this. Pag bumili kayo ng biosafety cabinet, don't forget to look at their... Um, power requirements okay and there should be a dedicated circuit breaker for your biosafety cabinet or in case here in the philippines i think uh, luby mentioned this one you need to have your ups long enough to provide you enough time to, to close your system if ever ever anything hap uh, wrong happens okay now the power plug in the philippines socket types are a b and c if you're planning to get your biosafety cabinet all the way from Australia, you might have a problem with that one because they have a totally different uh, plug, power plug. So you need to check your power plugs, okay? Now, um, after that lecture, I'm going to share to you common challenges that I've seen um, happen in, in the biosafety cabinets and procuring it. One, again, this is the most common one. Biosafety cannot fit through the door jams. Hamba ng pintuan. So through the improvement of your civil codes or the building codes, uh, the newer buildings have a wider door as opposed to our old buildings wherein kung saan lang umabot ang budget, ganun kalaki lang pintuan. Okay? So I think now the doors are roughly around 1.2 meters or 1 meter in, in width. So that's big enough to, to fit even your um, Class 2A2 by safety cabinets. Now, there are biosafety cabinets that we are, that are very high, right? So, so you need to look into the dimensions of, your, of the biosafety cabinet you are buying. You might want to check the actual measurements as opposed to the, to the door. And again, the, the number two one is the corner and sharp, narrow corridors and corners. It's the same thing. The dimension of the biosafety cabinet doesn't allow you to actually place it where you're where your ideal place would be. So you need to check that area as well. 
one way to remedy this is if you want to quote or you want to buy your biosafety cabinet, you include into the contract that the supplier would cover all the cost for civil works in connection with the installation of your biosafety cabinet. So that's one of the things that you might want to include in your price quotations. Now, the second one is elevators or second floor installations or higher floor installations. You might check again the weight of your biosafety cabinet and talk to your engineer and ask them if your elevator can actually carry your biosafety cabinet up to the next floors. Imagine buying um, 700,000 equipment and not being able to use it just because you cannot bring it up the stairs or up your elevator, right? That would be very frustrating, okay? No power outlet near the installation site. No, people get excited when they buy buy safety cabinets. Parang, oh, dito natin lagay, ha? Oh, maganda yan. This is the appropriate area. You have your clearances. You have your ducting here. It's perfect. Then the buy safety cabinet comes in. Then the, the, the supplier would tell you, um, sir, saan pati sasaksak yan? And you guys would look at yourselves and you'd say, oh my God, we missed that one. <laughs> right? Again, the ceiling is too small. That's a common problem. Now, no on-site calibration certification. I think I, I went through this when discussing the support portion. So you need to know your after sale support, including calibration and certification services. Okay. Now, you forgot to include the installation commissioning of exhausting oh, exhaust ducting. Now, I think this is common for TV labs. Right? For TV labs, I think they require ducting, exhaust ducting. Um, there are people who buy their their biosafety cabinets with the ducting in mind, but not the ducting in the price quotation. So they receive their biosafety cabinets, they get excited again, installed it, and they ask the supplier, "Sana po yung ducting natin," and the supplier would look at you and say, "Ah, hindi po siya kasama sa presyo na binayaran niyo." So that is one one of the things that you need to look at if if you want if you require exhaust ducting, okay? Now, this, this is the one that bothers us all, the operational expense of actually buying your biosafety cabinet. Now, uh, going back to the title of the of webinar, What's Under Your Hood, and the, and the comparison between a vehicle is actually the same. Uh, if you buy a vehicle, there's an operational cost that comes with it. Yung gas mo, yung tol mo, yung langis mo, yung gulong mo, yung insurance mo. That's the same with your biosafety cabinet. If, you're buy, if you buy your biosafety cabinet, let's say for example, 500,000, it doesn't end there. You have to pay for electricity. You have to pay for calibration. You have to pay for your ducting. You have to pay for your filters. All right? So you need to account for that one if you plan to get your biosafety cabinet. All right. So I guess that, that ends my presentation. I hope I didn't bore you all with all the technicalities. Um, Ma'am Michelle, uh, so thank you guys for listening. Yes. But... Uh, thank you, Sir Edison, for that comprehensive lecture. I hope our colleagues will be able to apply and share this knowledge in their own laboratory. So we have a question here. How would we know if the airflow is functioning well? Ah, that's one of the things that Mr. Louis said. You need to get your biosafety cabinet calibrated and certified. That's the only way to ensure that there's enough airflow going inside your biosafety cabinet and there are enough exhausted air getting ejected. So you just don't look at the air that's going inside your biosafety cabinet, but also the air that's being exhausted. To, to determine actually if your buy safety cap is safe. Now, uh, they have a crude way of, uh, te of testing it. Since we're into the protection of personnel, you can do the smoke test. A smoke test is simply just lighting up uh, a piece of paper and blowing it off para may usok. Then you check if the, if the smoke goes in, your buy safety cabinet it doesn't go out. Uh, so that's one of the old ways that we we try to check our our biosafety cabinet airflow. Yung katol natin mausok to. So you check the bottom. Yes, Paul. You run it across the bottom of your, well, the the lower part of the the opening. 
then the sides and actually on top as well. So if you if you have enough airflow going in, all those smoke should go in. No no airflow should go out. All right. Okay. So another question: Can plus three hoods be used by two persons since there are two pairs of gloves? Oh, yeah, I think I'm. I failed to mention the size of the biosafety cabinets. There are actually several sizes. I think there's a three feet one. There's a four foot, six foot, and there's the longer eight foot version. Now, uh, again, you you need to determine first what your what you guys are would want to do. Uh, basically, if you have a four foot biosafety cabinet, you cannot fit two persons. And I think we discourage bigger biosafety cabinets that are class two in size, just mainly because if you have more people working across an open sash, you have more disruption of the air curtain. Now for class three bio biological cabinets, yes, uh, you could, uh, yeah, two persons can use the, bio, the class three biosafety cabinet as long as it can be, you have the enough gloves in place. Right? But um, okay. for crowding purposes, we, we tend to use it sparingly. The most is two persons, not three, not four. Yes. Okay. So, uh, last question. So, what is the indication that you, that you replace the HEPA filter? Oh, indicator that you replace the HEPA filter. One, if you're in the laboratory and someone is servicing your biosafety cabinet, you should be there to, to actually, one is to... to to ensure that they don't touch other contaminated materials. And the next one is to ensure that they install the right parts. And another check would be your calibration and certification uh, procedure. If you mm -hmm. replace your, your filters because it is clogged, definitely when you get it certified, it should not be clogged anymore. All right. Uh, well, aside from those two things, I think I cannot imagine another way to ensure you have new HEPA filters. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. So it looks like we're running out of time. We will collate all unread questions and have them answered and post them on the BRAP and PAMET website for your perusal. So thank you for our resource speaker for answering our questions. So in the first lecture, Mr. Edson discussed what is BSC and the different kinds of BSC. Biosafety is for containment. He differentiated BSC 1, 2, 3, and 4. What is the difference between BSC, fume hood, and laminar flow? He also discussed the processes in selecting the right BSC to use. He taught us the 5S operational assessment system, sample structure, standard, and support. Engineering controls, administrative controls, work practices, personnel for risk assessment. A very important aspect is where do you place the BSC in your lab. On the second lecture, Sir Louis focus on the proper procedure and best practices whenever we are working in a biosafety cabinet, as well as the things that to be considered before using a BSC. He also discussed the BSC failure response procedure in case of untoward incident happen. These procedures must be properly followed by all personnel working in a biosafety cabinet to prevent aerosol exposures and laboratory acquired infections. We would like to thank both our speakers tonight for expanding our knowledge on biosafety cabinets, as well as our participants for your time in joining us. I hope we all learned from tonight's webinar and bring home the knowledge that BSCs are the best engineering control we will ever have in our quest to win the battle against exposures and laboratory-acquired infections. I'm also grateful for the people behind the e-learning activity 
who greatly contributed to make this webinar successful. BRAP's auditor, Professor Oliver Shane Dumawal, who is in charge of the technical platform and post-webinar activities, and to BRAP Secretary, Dr. Laila Florento, for working hard just to make this webinar possible despite of the distance. Most importantly, to the support of our noble BRAP's President, Dr. Martin Moreno, and BRAP's Vice President and PAMET's National President, Mr. Roni Puno. So thank you so much for your drive in providing continuous education program to our PAMET and BRAP members despite of our current situation. So beginning tomorrow, June 12, the videos of the first B PAMET or first BRAP PAMET webinar entitled Essential Biosafety in COVID-19 will be available for viewing in YouTube. Just search BRAP PAMET webinar or BRAP distance learning and don't forget to like and subscribe while you're on it and click the notification bell if you want to be notified by email of future lectures to be posted. This is another way of BRAPS bring you to a new knowledge and updated. Thank you everyone and hope you will join us in our next webinar. Good night and good luck on your post test. Be safe and bio safe everyone. This is Ella, BRAPS Assistant Treasurer and tonight's moderator signing off. From the BioRisk Association of the Philippines Incorporated and the Philippine Association of Medical Technologies Incorporated, we hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as we did enjoy preparing it for you. We take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to Dr. Leila Laney Florento for managing and directing the webinar flow, to Professor Oliver Shane Dumawell who handles the pre and post webinar logistics, to Ms. Alessio, our webinar moderator, to the two pillars of their respective associations, Dr. Martin Moreno and Sir Ronnie Puno and to all you viewers out there for joining us. Lastly, kindly hit the like icon and subscribe button to get access to more training videos. Hit the notification bell too if you would like to be notified by email of our future lectures. See you in our next video.